some legalities around what has to be included in the exam that you have. Um, and then there are things that dentists look for because they have their favorite procedures that they do and they're looking to see whether you need one of those because that's, you know, they're, they're looking to do more of those this month or whatever it is. So the exam is essentially the same no matter how old the person is, but of course it's going to be very brief on a three-year-old. They just don't have as many teeth and they may not sit still as long. It has to be done super quickly. And it's very helpful to have somebody taking notes during the exam because, um, you know, in an adult, I can look in and then I can reach over and write some notes down and then look in again. But you don't get that luxury with a two and three year old. And so the, the main thing about the exam is it is different in a holistic office from a mainstream office. Um, the, the essential elements are still there, but holistic dentists view, especially the way I do it, I, I really, when I look in your mouth, I'm hoping to see everything beautiful and healthy and perfect. When I look in, that's what I hope to find. I actually want to look in and not find anything to do. I'm not hoping for breakdown. I'm not hoping you have decay. I'm not hoping you're missing teeth so I can, you know, recommend an implant or a bridge or whatever else, you know, for replacing teeth. Um, I don't look in your mouth like a business person. I look in your mouth like a healthcare practitioner, hoping to see health, perfect health, beautiful, you know, healthy tissues and teeth. And I think that over time, as dentistry has shifted, the, indus the entire industry itself has shifted from being focused on health and health care to being focused on business and the bottom line and bonus pay for staff and um, beyond making ends meet, but dentistry as a capital investment so that you can retire well and all of that way of thinking in our society. But dentistry isn't just a job where you try to, you know, earn as much money as you can. Like the name of the game is to, you know, the person with the most at the end wins or something. Healthcare and business interests are inherently in a conflict of interest. And, you know, I've, I've given you a little bit of a flavor of why that is and how that manifests in an office. In an office where the staff gets paid bonuses, if the dentist is sort of, mm, you know, lenient, like see something and you think it's just very, very minor and, and maybe it could still remineralize and, um, you know, you want to just do a little bit of instruction for the patient to help them remineralize that and you'll look at it again, you know, later or in six months at the next exam or the next x-rays and see if it's uh, unchanged or whether it's continued to deteriorate, in which case you would do a filling. That's a very conservative approach. Obviously, that's not a big money maker. You know, the, the money is, oh, I see a little something happen. We well, better do a filling there. And the staff will get their bonuses based on production. And they're happy the more stuff the dentist finds to do. And the more you can convince patients to come in quickly to get the work done, you know, which a lot of times means sort of emphasizing urgency and creating a sense of urgency and that if you don't go along with our advice that you're neglectful of your own health or worse yet your children's health, right? And that sort of way that doing, running a dental office has evolved in that direction 
um, you know, that's if you rush and you get that, oh, well, you know, that really should be done. And do you have time today? We can do it right now. And and then the staff is, you know, super happy because they're going to, that month, you know, that raises the production and collection for that month and they're going to get a little bigger paycheck. And I, I, at my office, I don't want anybody to be influenced to hope that you, when you come in for your exam, that you have something wrong in your mouth. There's something spiritually wrong with hoping that somebody has something wrong health-wise so that we can, you know, do something and make some money. I mean, that's just somehow the profession has turned in that direction, and that seems to be the, the mode, the way people's mindsets are. Because the dental business has taken over everybody's thought processes and way of being. And in a pure healthcare setting where there isn't any profit motive, then, you know, we should all hope that you are healthy. And obviously, you know, people come into a dental office not always because something hurts or something's sharp or broken or chipped or moved or whatever is happening. That's sometimes the reason people come in. Something has happened and they need to find out what their options are for fixing something. But probably, at least in a holistic office where people are overall kind of a healthier slice of the population already, um, people come in probably, I don't know what the percentages are, but we probably have a higher percentage of people that come in just for routine checkups and cleanings who don't have anything wrong, who have been very diligent and whose overall systemic health is good and they don't have breakdown due to acidity or alkalinity issues um, in their mouths that shows up in their mouths. And there are things. I mean, you know, you come in for a routine exam, we may see something starting to happen that doesn't feel like anything yet, and we, you know, kind of educate you and help you adjust what you're doing at home to mitigate that before it becomes something that needs a procedure, right? And in a holistic healthcare setting, the way I have mine set up, that's the, the way I do things. And most of the people, I wouldn't say most, I don't, I don't really know what the percentages are, but a lot, it does seem to me that a lot of what I do is very routine exams and cleanings where I don't find anything wrong that needs immediate fixing or attention. Yes, sure, sometimes I do. And then I will tell people, yes, and I'm, I'm very honest with people about whether it's urgent or not or whether it can just wait until their next visit or uh, whether they should do it immediately or it's okay to wait a month until, you know, they get their next paycheck and can afford to come in and get it done or whatever. Because sometimes the finances are an issue. And if something really is urgent, then, you know, finances are finances, but the break further breakdown may be imminent on a particular tooth. And I might on occasion send people for a second opinion somewhere about the health of the nerve or um, a, something I see in the bone around the tooth uh, before I recommend a particular treatment uh, for the area. And so sometimes people have to go and get a second opinion at a specialist and then come back for, you know, final, my final word on what I think their options are for that, whatever the problem is. All right, so the exam that I do is extremely thorough. It's, you know, it's based on holistic thinking. So there are a lot of elements to it. And I'm going to, in the next segment of this show, I will go through some of the areas that we cover during the exam. And I don't do my exam, leave you in suspense, and make you come back for a, a treatment consultation where we give you like a long laundry list and, and, and upsell and, you know, and motivate you through fear and urgency. 
to come in and, and get it all done, regardless of your situation at, in your personal life. So we don't do it that way. We, we, as I'm doing the exam, I'm answering questions and explaining things as I go and giving you information about your options as we go through the exam. So you're not in suspense <laughs> and you know what is going on and things that you were concerned about, I can reassure or confirm as we go during the exam. So the exam is longer. I spend more time in my exam because I allot enough time to have those discussions, especially for new patients. All right, we're going to head into a break. You're listening to Dental MD. I'm Dr. Jessica Sapoff. And if you have questions or you want to reach us, uh, reach the front desk by email, which right now that's probably the easiest way. That's appointments at naturaldentist.com. Um, and you can also call the office. It's 206-257-4921. And uh, I'm talking about the dental examination today. And I'll be right back after this break. All right, we're going to start with this. Forget what you know about going to the dentist. You know, I'm talking those painful procedures. Metal debris flying all around, heavy drugs dulling your senses. Do your smile a favor. Even do your body a favor. Learn about Natural Dental Health Associates. It's just located right off the I-90 on Mercer Island. Natural Dental Health Associates offers only those treatments that are comfortable, safe, and effective. Suffer from TMJ? Snoring? Sleep apnea? Well, then you'll want to log on to naturaldentist.com. Want to ditch the headgear? Log on to naturaldentist.com. Worried your kids aren't getting the best care possible? Again, log on to naturaldentist.com. Natural Dental Health Associates has received a five-star EnviroStar rating for the last 20 years. You can't fake caring. You can't fake commitment. So start with naturaldentist.com and end with a smile you deserve. Hi, I'm Danica Patrick and proud aunt. Watching my nieces grow, play, and learn is amazing, but not every child gets to be carefree. One in six kids in the U.S. are hungry. One in six. That little girl sitting alone at the playground, she can't play like the other kids. She doesn't have the energy because she's hungry. School lunch will be her only meal today. It breaks my heart that this is the reality in our country but it's something that Feeding America is working to change. Each year, the Feeding America network of food banks rescues billions of pounds of good food that would have gone to waste. This food is then provided to families and children in need. Being a kid should be about using your imagination, learning, and having fun. These children shouldn't have to miss out on simply being a kid because they're hungry. To find out how you can help end childhood hunger in your community, visit feedingamerica.org. Brought to you by Feeding America and the Ad Council. Get your daily dose of variety. Alternative Talk, 1150. Welcome to Dental MD. I'm Dr. Jessica Sapoff, and today's show is about the dental exam. And every there's, there's, there are certain rules that dentists have to follow in order to maintain their licensure. So as far as that goes, um, every dentist has to do their own exam. If you had an exam at another office and you want to switch and come and you said, well, I just had an exam and they said I didn't have any decay, I just want a cleaning, uh, we can't do that. A cleaning, you think of it as, oh, it's just a cleaning. It's just the hygienist or, you know, it's just, you know, clean my teeth. And it's not really dental treatment. Well, yes, legally it's dental treatment. It is gum treatment. It's periodontics. It's, you know, there are lots of different levels of cleanings that people need. And you might say, well, but I never needed deep cleanings. No one ever said I had gum disease, so it's just a cleaning. Well, it may not be. And you as a patient, your assessment of what your 
needs are as far as your cleanings is, um, you know, it is what it is, but every dentist has to do their own exam before rendering treatment. And a dental cleaning, even if it's a simple one, is still considered dental treatment. Frequently, you know, the gum tissue in one spot or another will bleed while we're doing the cleaning or, you know, will bleed while we're doing the, uh, the um, periodontal exam and charting to check for any uh, pocketing around the gum tissue, bacteria living on the roots. We have to check these things. And any procedure that, that has the potential to draw blood or, you know, really, even if not, the, the mouth is a very uh, germy place, and we have to do all of the, um, you know, infection control procedures. Just like with a major surgery, everything is the same. Everything has to be done the same way because we have to prevent cross-contamination. And it is, it's a dental treatment. We're picking up sharp instruments and we're doing a procedure on your teeth. It may be just a cleaning, but it is still considered a procedure. Anyway, in order to maintain a license in any state in this country, every dentist has to do their own diagnostic assessment prior to rendering any treatment. And that goes for everything. So if you recently had an exam, then I might be willing to do a limited exam if you recently had a complete exam. But my limited exam is going to cover all the basic things I need to look at before I can render treatment. I need to make sure that you don't have any signs of oral cancer. I need to make sure uh, I know whether you have any gum disease starting anywhere in your mouth. I need to check for any decay and breakdown. I need to check your, uh, you know, screen your uh, TMJ, which is the jaw joint in front of your ear, and make sure there isn't any, you know, major thing going on there. And basically, you know, I can do a limited exam. It's called a specific exam where we're just looking at certain things or talking about a specific problem. If you have, if you don't, if you're just coming in for a second opinion about something, like a tooth broke and some other dentist told you you needed X, Y, and Z and you want another opinion about it and find out if there are any other choices or any other ways to do X, Y, and Z, then I can do an exam where we look at that specific problem and I give you an opinion about that area, that issue. But if you're coming in for the first time and you've never been in our office before, um, ideally we need to do a complete exam. And if we don't do the total exam on the first visit, then before we can render treatment, we need to do the complete exam before we can treat any issues. And uh, generally that includes cleanings. So, except in very um, specific circumstances, depending on the, on the case, I can sometimes do a shorter exam before a cleaning. But nevertheless, an exam must be done, and it must check for certain things. And every dentist must do their own exam. We cannot take the word of another practitioner of any type as our own as though that were our own diagnosis, because we're legally responsible for that diagnosis and can be held liable if that diagnosis is not accurate and anything that's done based on that diagnosis um, runs into um, uh, problems. So that is the story, the legality of that. Now, over the years, Things have been added to the dental exam, such as screening for oral cancer, screening for sleep apnea, screening for TMJ problems, uh, besides the usual looking for decay and gum disease. 
So, and crowded teeth, of course. So, some of these things have been added because lawyers have reamed dentists in court for missing certain things. And so those things got added to routine exams. And for good reason, for good reason, because, you know, we should be looking for those things. We should be screening you. And the exam that I do is, it's, it's pretty long. I, I screen for not just, I'm not looking at your jaw joint just to see whether um, you're able to open wide enough for me to do all the things I want to do in your mouth. I mean, you know, you need to let dentists know if your jaw hurts after being open for just a couple of minutes. And a lot of dentists are, they, they just want to write down whether you have these issues and they don't necessarily know what to do about it when they find it. So as a holistic dentist, I've taken hundreds and hundreds of hours of extra continuing education to make sure that that I know if I, if I don't, if I choose not to treat certain things, that I know what your options are likely to be and that I can send you, refer you to a practitioner that can treat those things. So in, in, uh, in my office, I go through, well, the first thing we do is we find out what your, what your, it's called chief complaint, but it's the reason that you're in. If it's just, you know, time for a routine exam, then we write that down. But if you have other things like, you know, you're concerned about uh, the types of fillings that are in your teeth or you are um, noticing more bleeding when you brush your teeth or your jaws started clicking and making a lot more noise or your uh, bed partner has reported that you're snoring and that you sometimes stop breathing. These are, you know, or, or you have something that broke, a tooth that broke or a crown that's broken or fell off or something like that going on, um, or you've noticed odors coming from your mouth and you're concerned about it and want to make sure you don't have, you know, a problem or infection. Um, all of these things, you know, we write down what your concerns are and then I address those questions and concerns first. I don't do the exam in my order every time. I do the exam in the order that will alleviate your concerns and fears first. So if your question is about a particular tooth and it's on the upper left, but I usually start my exam on the upper right, I will start on the tooth that you are pointing to and we will address that one first, find out what's going on with it, talk about that one. And when you're satisfied, then I will go on with my exam in the order that I normally do things. So the first thing, you know, once we have that chief concern, the first thing I want to do is address whatever's in that chief concern. If your teeth, you know, you've had ortho twice, but your teeth have relapsed again and they're crowded and your jaw is clicking and you're noticing where your teeth are shifting, I'm going to talk about that issue first. If you have a tooth that's had a root canal and You've noticed lately that when you bite on it, it feels squishy and it's moving and um, white stuff is coming out of the gum tissue along the edge on that tooth. Then we're going to look at that tooth first. We're going to find out what's going on, get x-rays. And I'm gonna t In the next segment, I'm going to talk about the x-rays that we take. But the exam is very thorough. But one of the things that I feel, you know, for myself as a health practitioner as a dentist, I think that there's much more post traumatic like medical and dental post traumatic stress than people recognize. And, you know, that's a big name to give it, but it's really, you know, the the littler name for that is just dental fear, or dental phobia. You have a phobia, you break out in a sweat at the idea of going to the dentist or you're fine until the chair tilts back or whatever it is, if that's going on with you, then that is the first thing we're going to address. How do we how can we do our exams and treatments in a way that keeps you comfortable? 
And there are lots and lots of ways to do that besides giving you sed sedatives and drugs for that. There are a lot of other strategies that can be employed um, instead of or in addition to um, sedatives. Okay, so we're going to head into a break. You're listening to Dental MD. I'm Dr. Jessica Sapoff. If you have questions or you want to make an appointment, uh, we're located on Mercer Island. We are right above Mercy Vet and above, if, you're, if you don't have a pet but you eat chocolate, we're above O Chocolate right there on Mercer Island. So you just drive up 27th and around the back of those um, businesses and we're on the top floor on that building. Okay, so if you want to uh, reach us by email, it's appointments at naturaldentist.com and the phone number is 206-257-4921. And I'll be right back after the break. I'm Dr. Anthony Lazowitz, and this is Climate Connections. American drivers spend a lot of time going nowhere, from warming up the engine to sitting in traffic or stuck at a drive through all those idling cars surprisingly consume about three billion gallons of fuel annually and that produces about 30 million tons of CO2. Patricia Weikersheimer of the Argonne National Laboratory says that pollution can be reduced. Many drivers keep their engines running because they believe that restarting burns more fuel than idling. But research shows it's usually more efficient to shut off the car. Idling more than 10 seconds in your passenger vehicle consumes more fuel and produces more CO2 than does turning it off and starting it back up again. So she suggests that drivers turn off their engines when they're stopped at train crossings or drive throughs School pickup and drop-off zones are especially important places to shut off the engine because that also reduces kids' exposure to tailpipe pollution. Weikersheimer says reducing idling is a zero-cost way to save fuel cut carbon pollution, and improve air quality. And it starts with drivers asking themselves, Do I need to have my engine on now? Climate Connections is produced by the Yale Center for Environmental Communication. Learn more at YaleClimateConnections.org. Alternative Talk 1150. We're on your radio at 1150 AM. We're on your HD radio at 98.9 Channel 3. So many ways to listen. We're on the web at 1150kknw.com. Streaming live audio and video as well as MP3 archives of many of our shows. So many ways to listen. And now, we're on your smartphone or tablet. Download our free app in the Apple App Store or Google Play and take Alternative Talk 1150 anywhere you go. So many ways to listen. Ready to shake things up? Try Alternative Talk 1150. Okay, welcome back. You're listening to Dental MD. I'm Dr. Jessica Sapoff. And today I'm talking about the dental exam. And I'm going to, during this segment, I'm going to talk about x-rays. But first, I'm going to talk about how the exam differs for different age groups. So about 30% of the practice that I have is babies through teens because I really enjoy treating children. And sometimes, you know, well, in, in most dental offices, and, and I'm there, I don't think most general dentists really want to treat kids. It's a little bit unpredictable. Sometimes kids don't um, want to cooperate for exams and treatment. And, you know, when they do, then you can stay on schedule. And when they don't, your schedule blows up, you know, because you can get behind or not get everything done or, you know, they're just a little unpredictable and they can be a little loud sometimes. Um, you know, I tell them it's, uh, it's like a library. Let's use our library voices, you know, <laughs> or um, anyway, use your, use your indoor whisper. So um, kids have to be trained. They have to learn sort of the, you know, I call it office etiquette. <laughs> they have to learn what's expected of them. And they don't necessarily 
get everything done in the same number of visits that adults do. Sometimes it's more visits because they're, they're still learning. And, you know, the first time they've ever had a filling done, there's a lot of what we call tell, show, do. There's a lot of explaining. There's a lot of showing them what it is. Um, this thing holds the cotton rolls, and this thing helps you stay open, and this thing, you know, whatever. This, this next thing doesn't smell very good for a second. And, you know, sometimes with the little kids, one whiff of something that doesn't smell good to them and the appointment is over. I mean, they're like squirming and they're sitting up and they're done. So, or something that doesn't taste good is uh, even more likely to um, interrupt the appointment. So we try on kids to use techniques that don't have strong odors or tastes or we really try to shield them from experiencing that um, as much as possible or, and or uh, let them know that it's just going to be for a second or whatever. But when you're working with a two and three year old that are kind of um, just early verbal, um, sometimes you have to do well. In our office, we will do things over a series of appointments instead of trying to get everything done in one visit, including the exam. The exam itself, sometimes it takes two or three visits to get. A complete exam done on a very young child and we have the parents uh, practice at home with a towel and sunglasses and and I tell them stand behind and to the right of your child have someone else hold your um, little boy or girl and you stand behind and to the right and look over their shoulder and do their brushing and flossing from behind and to the right, which is the same position I stand in when I do my exam and treatments. That way they sort of get used to the whole, you know, where you are and that they're wearing sunglasses while you're brushing their teeth and that kind of stuff. So that when I hand them some sunglasses or put sunglasses on them, it isn't, you know, a two-year-old will reach up and, and grab the sunglasses and remove them from their face. They are not usually understanding that it's for their safety, of course, because they're very young. So you have to gradually get them used to wearing a pair of sunglasses during the treatment because it's for safety. And sometimes with the kids that are like maybe four and five, they'll ask, why do I have to wear these? And it's more than just that the bright light is on their face and that that's not pleasant because that is one of the reasons, of course. But the other reason, that's why it's sunglasses and not just regular, you know, safety glasses. So it's sunglasses uh, for the bright lights. But what I'll do is I'll take a cotton roll or a piece of gauze and I'll just lay it on one of the, you know, on top of the glasses so they can see it. And I say, well, just in case, you know, I drop something like a piece of gauze, then your eyes are safe. And they're like, okay, they understand that. So and I'm not scaring them. I'm just, you know putting a little piece of gauze down on the glasses so they can see that, you know, it's better if that is on the glasses and not on their face. So just, you know, because they, they need to learn it is safety. When you're lying back and you're prone and, you know, things can fall. It's very rare. It really is very rare, but it can happen. Things can, or little pieces of stuff from the mouth, like even just flossing and having a piece of food occasionally a piece of food will be stuck between the teeth and you know we try to control it but there is a certain amount of um, stuff can fly and you don't want that landing on someone's face or in their eye I mean this stuff has a lot of bacteria so anyway it is for safety for a lot of different reasons we'll just leave that one there so for young children we have them lie on mom or dad um, which is very comfortable for them. And then mom or dad can put their arms around them and hold them and maybe hold their hands and help support their face. And we put the glasses on mom or dad as well. We have adult sunglasses and children's sunglasses. And we will do, I'll do my exam very quickly. And sometimes kids don't want to open and they'll make a lot of noise and squirm and refuse to let me count their teeth and you know that's that's okay we'll maybe do the exam over a couple of visits maybe I'll just sort of 
um, you know, peek inside under the lips and say, okay, thank you so much for letting me look, you know, at your lips and the front of your teeth and we'll look at your back teeth next time. So this is definitely not the most efficient way to do dentistry. Like how can any dental office make money spending so much time, three different visits? And of course it's not as convenient for the parents either. In in other dental offices where they treat children, they if the child does not open and cooperate for the exam, they simply recommend general anesthesia for the child and they finish the exam under general anesthesia and the parents sign something saying whatever you find I give you permission to do everything that you find that you see needs to be done or that you think will need to be done and then they put the child under general anesthesia and they crank the mouth open and do all the work on all the teeth that they see and Frequently, if they find medium to large decay, they will be putting stainless steel crowns. And if the decay is deep, they'll be doing baby root canals on the primary teeth and then putting stainless steel crowns. They're going to do all of that in one very efficient visit. And then you get your child back and your child is waking up from the sedation and you get them home and it's fine. Most of the time this is very safe. The dentists that do this do it routinely. But in my opinion, I'm parents come to me because they don't want their children to be given medications unless it's something urgent. And to me, doing an exam and doing um, small and medium, even even deep uh, decay restorations uh, in teeth with large defects. In, in my office, I will do this treatment. If there's something urgent then or, or already infected or becoming systemic like an abscess or something that's about to abscess or, or there's, you know, pain and the nerves are involved in the teeth already, then I'm not going to do this gradual approach. I'm going to recommend going, having sedation and getting it done right away. But if it isn't urgent like that, then I am comfortable doing the treatment over several visits. Now, a lot of parents are driving a long way to get to the office and coming several times in traffic or, you know, just having to spend an hour or two or three on the road with the kids just for a dental visit where we don't even know how much we're going to be able to get done. You know, for, for a lot of people, that would be... Um, out of the question. But for parents who do have the desire and the ability to, um, you know, have multiple appointments like that and who are adamant that they don't want their children under any kind of sedation or medication unless it's medically urgent, um, they, they will be willing to come in multiple times for appointments until we get everything finished. And it's really amazing how much we can get done on children once the child understands what's expected of them and they, they've built up trust and we're not a stranger anymore. We're, you know, they get a, a toy every time they come in, even if all we did was, you know, um, put the sunglasses on, go for a ride in the chair and take the sunglasses off. Even if that's all we did, uh, they get a toy and, um, you know, when when kids come to our office, um, they're, they're respected just like adults are. <clears throat> if they say something is uncomfortable, I'm going to stop and find out what's go, what they're feeling, what they're experiencing, and then I'm going to offer to try a different instrument or a different shape thing and try and maybe go a little more slowly or um, work on a different area and then come back to that one. I'm going to navigate through that with the child, always getting the child's permission to proceed. And that builds trust. It makes everything less scary. It, it creates a relationship between the child and me that's based on trust. And 
once that is established, I can get a whole lot of stuff done on some very young children. And they will sit in the chair and, oh, and I'm talking under age five. They will sit in the chair and open and let me get everything done. You know, I'll clean away decay and put on sealants and put in fillings and take impressions for orthodontic expanders and all kinds of things that it would seem to be impossible to get done on children that age. But, but we do it. But it, it takes time. It's not efficient, but there's no uh, drugging and sedating. So, you know, that is an option. And I'm happy to do that for parents that want it done that way. All right, we're going to go into a break, and I'm going to talk about x-rays in the next section. All right, so we're talking about the dental exam today. And if you want to reach us to make an appointment or give us a call, the, um, the phone number is 206-257-4921. And the email, which is probably the easiest way to reach us and get um, a response during the day, it's easier to do that. Uh, the email is appointments at naturaldentist.com. And you're listening to Dental MD. I'm Dr. Jessica Sapoff, and I'll be right back after this break. All right, we're going to start with this. Forget what you know about going to the dentist. You know, I'm talking those painful procedures. Metal debris flying all around, heavy drugs dulling your senses. Do your smile a favor. Even do your body a favor. Learn about Natural Dental Health Associates. It's just located right off the I-90 on Mercer Island. Natural Dental Health Associates offers only those treatments that are comfortable, safe, and effective. Suffer from TMJ? Snoring? Sleep apnea? Well, then you'll want to log on to naturaldentist.com. Want to ditch the headgear? Log on to naturaldentist.com. Worried your kids aren't getting the best care possible? Again, log on to naturaldentist.com. Natural Dental Health Associates has received a five-star EnviroStar rating for the last 20 years. You can't fake caring. You can't fake commitment. So start with naturaldentist.com and end with the smile you deserve. 145 over 92. 180 over 111. 182 over 100. And I had a heart attack and a cardiac arrest and then a stroke. Your blood pressure numbers could change your life. A lot of people don't understand, including myself, I didn't, now I do, uh, the impact of having a stroke. My memory is shot. When I woke up, I couldn't speak. Lowering your high blood pressure could save you from a heart attack or stroke. If you've stopped your treatment plan, restart it, or talk to your doctor about creating one that works better for you. Start taking the right steps at manageyourbp.org. It's a new life, but I'm going to make it better. I'm coming back. Ask your doctor. Check your blood pressure. Brought to you by the American Heart Association, American Medical Association, and the Ad Council. There's a reason they invented the Internet. It's called 1150kknw.com. All right. You're listening to Dental MD. Welcome back. I'm Dr. Jessica Sapoff. And today I'm talking about the dental exam. And in the last segment, I went over really how we manage the young kids. And in most offices, uh, they either don't treat children or they treat them with sedation, different levels of sedation. Uh, usually it's just called general anesthesia, but it's, it's actually just a medium to deep sedation where the child is still breathing um, on their own. They're not intubated. And they are, you know, a, not fully asleep. They're still, like, responsive, I guess. You know, there are different levels of this, but they're, um, it's not as deep of a general anesthesia state as during a, you know, medical surgery type of situation. But it is, it's 
deep enough and it's a a type of sedation where they don't remember the procedure. So they don't have a conscious post-traumatic stress um, from it. So there is a lot of medical and dental phobia that like post-traumatic stress really, you know, and w- when somebody is sitting in my chair um, and they're starting to feel a little bit nervous, they don't necessarily know why it's not anything specific that I'm doing. Um, I, I will want to know what you as a patient are experiencing while you're in my chair. If you're uncomfortable at all, including feeling kind of your heart rate going up or feeling a little bit cold and clammy or the most common (laughs) emergency in a dental office is fainting, fainting. People go into a shallow breathing kind of situation because of the stress and the fear that they're, the anxiety that they're experiencing, which may have nothing to do with what's happening in the moment. It may just be, you know, an unconscious or subconscious memory of an experience that they had that their nervous system is um, re-experiencing right now for them. And so that anxiety and that upper chest breathing, that will result in kicking off your adrenals, which is why you go into a sweat. Anyway, if any of that kind of thing is happening for you, I definitely want you to I'll usually notice and ask you how you're doing and I'll stop and we'll talk about what's triggering you because there are so many different ways that I can do things in the dental office that can, that will be, um, you know, an unfamiliar way to get a thing done so that it doesn't trigger you. For instance, the office doesn't smell like a typical dental office. We don't, we have a lot of air filters around, usually smells and sounds are what trigger people. So we've done a lot of work to try to make the office feel different from a typical dental office so that people are not uh, triggered by sights and sounds and smells and that sort of thing. Um, but anything that triggers you or, or you know, I'm, I'm probably going to be reminding people very frequently, um, you know, are you breathing. Let's stop and take a breath and get a nice deep yoga breath and um, get oxygenated and then we'll resume. And I want to know like what it is that I'm doing that may be triggering you so that I can just pick up a different instrument or shift what I'm doing or change to a different area or whatever, whatever it is that's triggering you. There are lots of different ways to get things done and I'll switch to a way that's less triggering for you because each person is different. So in a lot of very subtle ways, the way I do your treatment is tailored to you. I will be as creative as I need to, to um, do your exam and treatment in a way that is as comfortable for you as we can manage. And you know, that, that takes time, and that's, you, are, you do not have to be a square peg fitting into a round hole. If you're a square peg, we're going to make the hole square, and we're going to accommodate every single way that we can so that the treatment is as comfortable and to your liking as possible and, and still get everything done and still get everything done to the uh, standard of care and above the standard of care, you know, that, that we can. So let's talk about x-rays. X-rays are ionizing radiation. They should be limited as much as possible. In a lot of dental offices, x-rays will be taken every at at intervals that someone's insurance will cover that's not how i do things i don't care what your insurance thinks the right interval is or how often they'll pay for we don't look to see you know oh this person's insurance will pay for x-rays again let's take some bite wings no 
I take x-rays according to the longest intervals possible, according to the not very trustworthy, but this is the standard for licensure and liability. So the American Dental Association has some suggested guidelines. And, you know, if you have had some decay recently, then you need to have your cavity check x-rays or bite wings done more frequently. But if you have not had any decay and you have no history of decay and I don't see any decay, then three years is the longest you can go between cavity check x-ray sessions. So if the last cavity check x-rays you had were three years ago and I still don't see anything wrong in your mouth and you're not having any problems or pain, I still need to take x-rays. That is just a fact. It's the way it is. I will stretch out the intervals as long as I can and as far as I can, but there is a limit. There is a limit. And until we have a technology where we can see if you have decay for sure in a way that is accepted by mainstream licensure boards in the dental industry, until we have an alternative way to verify whether there's decay and the depth of the decay that is accepted by the people who decide whether we get to have a license, until that day, we do have to take x-rays. That is the only option that we have that's accepted. So, but I will stretch out the intervals, like I said, and of course our x-rays are digital. And on top of that, there are different settings where you can lower it a little bit, and we do that. So all of our x-rays are digital. Our intraoral x-rays, which are the, you know, when we are doing periapicals or root pictures of individual teeth or bite wing x-rays where you bite on something and we get the upper and the lower teeth in the same view so we can look in between in the flossing areas and Then there's also panoramic, which is the one that goes around your head and shows us uh, where all the permanent teeth are down below on kids or, you know, where your wisdom teeth are and your sinuses. And in, in some cases on the panoramic, we can see calcifications in your carotid artery because those are in the view. And so these kinds of routine x-rays, you know, are screening x-rays or diagnostic x-rays, and they are required at certain intervals. And so we do that. All right. You have been listening to Dental MD. I'm Dr. Jessica Sapoff. If you want to reach us to make an appointment or to ask questions or find out whether this is where you want to go for a second opinion, reach us by email, appointments at naturaldentist.com or by phone, 206-257-4921. We're on Mercer Island. Thank you for listening to Dental MD, and I'll be back next week. The views expressed on this program are those of the host, guest, and callers, and not necessarily those of KKNW, its management, or other advertisers. Contests are the responsibility.